Today, we're kicking off our all-new Muscle Truck Series, and we're starting with the oldest grudge match in the book, Ford versus Chevy. We're dynoing Kevin's Lightning and Ryan's 454 SS, then taking them out for a test drive to see just what each guy's got to work with before we pit these two rivals in a head-to-head -head shootout. It's all today here on Trucks. Hey, welcome to the shop. Well, today on Trucks, we get to start Muscle Truck Wars. Over here, we've got a 1990 454 SS. Over here, we've got a 1994 Ford Lightning. So we're gonna take these two trucks, build them up, put them up against each other, and see which one comes out on top. Now, both of these trucks are roughly the same size and weight, but they're not necessarily on equal ground. Now, the Super Sport that I'm taking on is a big block. Kevin's Lightning, a small block both putting out about the same horsepower from the factory, but each one's potential comes from different places. So we're gonna take advantage of those differences, but set a similar power goal of somewhere north of 400 horse for both trucks. If we get a little bit better than that, well, that's good too. We're also gonna make these trucks handle a little bit better, throw some custom tweaks at them as well. But before we start turning wrenches, we're gonna take a look back and see how these trucks came about in the first place. The whole sport truck idea was first brought to market with Dodge's Little Red Express in 1978, which featured a 360 cubic inch V8, modified tranny and high stall speed converter hooked up to a limited slip rear end, and a cool looking appearance package that included chrome exhaust stacks coming straight up from the side step. The Little Red Express was the fastest American production vehicle from zero to 100 miles per hour in 1978. And although production was limited, it started a movement that is still strong today. And by the time the 454 SS truck rolled off the line in 1990, super sport vehicles had long since earned their reputation with the legendary big block Chevelles and El Caminos. The 1990 version, like mine, was rated at 230 horses but torque was right in line with a big block with a stump pulling 385 foot-pounds. Beefed up suspension and the last year of the Turbo 400 three-speed transmission hooked to a massive 14-bolt limited slip rear axle with 373 gears. The only chrome on the whole truck was the wheels. And if you ask me, the monochromatic black look was just plain mean. Now, the Lightning debuted in 1993 with its sole purpose being to knock the 454 SS off the block, give it some real competition, and maybe kick a few cyclones to the curb along the way. Now, like the 454 SS, the Lightning wasn't just an appearance package. The chassis had been stiffened, the whole truck was lowered, and sway bar diameter was increased to set it aside from the regular F-150 in the handling department. Racing legend Jackie Stewart was even brought on to help fine tune the Lightning's handling. 17 inch aluminum wheels, the E40D overdrive transmission, a lightweight aluminum drive shaft, and a similar single color appearance package gave these trucks all the earmarks of the 60s muscle cars with their fleet colors and no nonsense attitude. Now this 94 is one of only 1,100 Red Lightnings built that year, but they're still surprisingly affordable, which is kind of a well-kept secret, but maybe not for long. And there was more than 13,000 of these 454s produced in 1990, with a total of nearly 17,000 built during a 90 to 93 production run. So these trucks are a little easier to come by, which is good news for you guys if you're trying to get your hands on one. Yeah, and we wanted to get our hands on two decent trucks, both as close to stock as possible. Not the best truck, not the worst truck, just a decent representation of what's out there and available on the market. And today, we're gonna see what these trucks bring to the table. But, although they look nice, Ryan's truck's got almost 140,000 miles on it, and my Lightning has got almost 90,000 miles on it, so the chances are they're not in the best tune. The engine seems to run okay. The transmission shifts in and out of all the gears with no obvious issues, but underneath, it looks like the rear main seal has been leaking and 80s vintage aluminum wheels and co-op tires let you know that the original rolling stock is long gone. The paint job is recent and decent, but it's no show truck, and the windshield has seen better days. Inside, the seats are in okay condition considering the mileage, but the original center console is missing, so we'll have to do some digging to try to find one. But all in all, the truck appears to be a solid platform for us to build on. 
Now the Lightning's had a recent paint as well, but it's not perfect. As a matter of fact, they've even painted over a couple of dents. Now there's some obvious signs of a prior collision repair as well. Check out these bolts that hold the fender to the header panel. See this primer? That tells you that these bolts have been adjusted. And that's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. All that tells us is that this truck is no cream puff trailer queen and that the prior owner was not afraid to drive it. Now under the hood it's a little bit cleaner than Ryan's truck, but somebody's thrown a set of chrome valve covers on and obviously done an ignition upgrade. The truck runs pretty good and it shifts good, so there's no real surprises here. But now under the truck, somebody has hacked up the exhaust system and removed the catalytic converters. Now there's no way this is going to pass a visual inspection, let alone a tailpipe inspection, so we'll have to take care of this later on. Now obviously, we've got our work cut out for us to make these trucks competitive and reliable. But before we go any further, we want to see how these trucks compare in stock trim. And there's no better test for that than the head-to-head -head dyno pull. So we've got a little bit of routine maintenance to do to make sure both trucks are running right, and then we'll see how much more power the Ford makes than the Chevy. <laughs> you might start out making more power. If it's all said and done with, I'm winning. <laughs> Up next, Ryan's 454 SS gets the once over before heading to the dyno to see what kind of numbers it'll make. And later, it's Kevin's turn to clean up under the hood before he straps his lightning to the rollers. Hey, welcome back to Trucks. Today, we're kicking off a series of shows we're gonna call Muscle Truck Wars. And we're gonna start by pitting these two high-performance factory sport trucks against each other. But before we do any upgrades or add any power, we're gonna baseline each truck over at Joe and Mike's chassis dyna, which is a great way to establish a starting point and measure improvements. But just throwing a truck up on the rollers, it's a little reckless. That's right, because you want your basic systems like fuel, ignition, and cooling to be functioning properly so that you not only get an accurate baseline, but you don't damage your truck under wide open throttle. So we're gonna be doing a little checklist on each truck, starting with the 454. We surfed online and found the website of Dino Speed Racing in Memphis, Tennessee, and borrowed parts of their 32-point pre-dino checklist, along with using basic common sense to make sure each truck showed its true colors. Now that right there is exactly why we wanted to replace the old spark plugs. We're going to go back with an OE plug, gap to 35 thousandths, which is the factory spec, and at least we know our ignition will be firing strong. The factory electronic ignition on these trucks was great for a stock engine, but power can be lost with weak signals, so a stock replacement rotor, cap, and wires from O'Reilly Auto Parts got thrown back on. How's the coolant? <laughs> Not real pretty, but it'll, it'll do for now. <laughs> the radiator hoses all looked good, and the tanks didn't leak. So we rolled with the crappy looking coolant for now. But it's not a bad idea to flush the system before any serious upgrades, especially with a high mileage engine. With the truck up on our lift, we can take a closer look at the drive line. So with the engine oil draining, we replace the fuel filter since a clogged filter can rob power and lean the system out and checked and topped off the rear diff lube. All the U-joints seemed tight and there were no serious red flags around the pinion seals or rear transmission housing. It was a good shake. All right, now that we know nothing's gonna fall off and everything's back close to stock, I'll fill this thing up with some oil and we'll take it over to horsepower, see what kind of numbers we get at the wheels. Over at the horsepower shop, Mike Galley helped us lock the truck down. And once we had the big block warmed up to operating temperature, Ryan made a full throttle pull. What'd we end up with that run? 196.2 and 290.9. That's not too bad. That's better what, than I thought it would do. What it's rated at. Yep. Could be better, but could be worse. <laughs> What do we end up with? Sampling for five. 195, 299. Pretty consistent. Cool. Let's make one more run. Okay, run six, we got 194 horse and 300 foot pounds of torque. Cool. So they're within a few horsepower and a few yeah. foot pounds of torque. That's not too bad. That's not bad at all. Consider 140,000 miles on it. Yeah, really. Plus the parasitic loss from the transmission and everything else. So we're right about at stock ratings. Cool. When we come back, we'll see what the small block Ford's got for the big block Chevy. Stick around. Hey, 
Hey, welcome back to Trucks, where we're kicking off our muscle truck wars. But this is a battle that's been happening for a long, long time. Ford against Chevy in the form of this 94 Lightning that I've taken on up against the 1994 54SS that Ryan's adopted. Now, we've already established that the 454 is running okay, but it's definitely not living up to its power potential. We ended up with slightly under 200 horsepower and 300 foot-pounds at the rear wheels. Nothing to brag about. But considering power loss through an automatic transmission and the 140,000 odd miles, it's about what we expected, but we weren't blown away. But that's okay, we know we've got a good foundation to build on, as well as some pretty solid advantages over this little small block. <laughs> but now just like with Ryan's truck, we're going to do some routine maintenance, filters, fluids, check everything out before we get it on the dyno. We started by removing the plugs, since you can tell an awful lot about an engine by the color and condition of the electrodes. Now the plugs don't look bad, but the gap is crazy, it's over 50,000. So we're going to replace the plugs, but leave the ignition wires and cap alone, since that stuff is brand new. But we also noticed this cut vacuum line, which really needs to be fixed. A new air filter gets dropped in the stock box, and the vacuum line gets patched with some rubber tubing. If left alone, this could cause erratic idling or even a lean air fuel condition. How's it look? Pretty rusty, but it's full. With the lightning on the lift, we drained the oil, replaced the filter, checked all the other moving parts, and then we got a good look at the exhaust system. And like we said before, it's definitely been altered. There are obvious signs of leaking, but it's okay for a test. Look at the welding, look at the hair growing off of this stuff. It's a bunch of grapes. It's a wonder this truck even runs. <laughs> well, everything looks okay under here. We'll get a new fuel filter in place, get this thing over to the dyno. We all know the reputation of these vehicles. The question was, how much does the previous owner's experimentation and normal wear and tear eat away at stock performance? Uh, 224302. No way. Yeah. That's not bad. She's running a little fat. <laughs> what do we get, Tom? Uh, we got 228, 293. 228? That's not bad. Not bad at all. I think Ryan's gonna have his work cut out. I think he is. <laughs> After the break, Black and Red hit the road for a real world test. So try to hang on! Hey, welcome back. Well, so far we've got both of these trucks tuned up and pretty close to stock specs. And we went ahead and spun the dyno rollers to see what kind of horsepower and torque these trucks are making at the rear wheels but there's just no substitute for an actual road test. And even though my Lightning made more horsepower than the Super Sport, it's still not a real world comparison. So we're gonna take these trucks out for a spin, see how they do out on the street. Both these trucks have a distinctly different road feel than the regular production counterparts. Even with worn out shocks, bushings, and springs, they feel responsive and agile, more like sports cars than sport trucks. The Super Sport looks good with recent black paint. Even though the factory chrome wheels are gone and the stance is bone stock, this truck looks downright mean. The big block torque from the Chevy gave us a nice chirp going into second gear and accelerated fairly well all the way through the power band. But with 373 rear gears and no overdrive, it left us wishing for a four-speed automatic. The stopping proved to be another story, mostly due to the ABS module that only controls the rear brakes on our model. I don't think the ABS works. The Lightning sits a little lower and has a business-like sound, although traction can sometimes be a problem from a standing start. Now, both of these trucks were surprisingly close to the factory power numbers at the wheels, so it's also no surprise that with pavement under this truck, this Lightning is still capable of posting quarter-mile times like it did in 1994. 
It's amazing what just a few more years of automotive technology can bring about. And the Lightning, with its four-wheel anti-lock brakes, stopped a significant amount shorter than the Chevy. Ah, must be that big block dragging that other one forward. Well, all in all, this Lightning's pretty tight, but listen. Pretty good thumping. It's a twin I-beams, a center bushing. It's a little bit worn out, but for 88,000 miles, yeah, it's kind of expected. Now, it feels pretty good and strong when you punch it. The downshifts are nice. I want a firmer shift, and I want a heck of a lot more power, but this is a pretty good starting point. I also like the fact that it's got more rear wheel horsepower than that black bomb, and uh, quite frankly, we're going to put him in the dirt. Well, this 4,400 pound truck has a little bit of body roll, a little bit more than we like. So uh, maybe lower it down a little bit, get it center of gravity down, make it handle a little bit better. But really, it wasn't that bad for a big, heavy truck. Now you get up to about 45 miles an hour, about 50, you keep waiting for this thing to shift into overdrive. I'm so used to an overdrive transmission, but that's all right. And uh, it wouldn't hurt gas mileage either. You can watch the gauge just drop as you press the pedal. Now, Kevin might be starting out with a little bit better truck. I'll give him that. But uh, once we're all said and done with, this big block is going to mop the floor with that Ford. Well, here's something brand new from Matco Tools. If you're doing a painting project and you don't have much of a budget, well, now you don't have to spend an arm and a leg to get high-quality paint guns. Because Matco has just come out with their own line of gravity-fed HVLP and conventional guns. They feature high-quality machining in your standard air and fluid and fan controls. But the important thing here is that they use a stainless steel needle and seat and fluid tip, so you're going to get a long life out of this gun, plus continued accuracy throughout its use. Fluid tip sizes range from a .8 in the detail gun all the way up to a 2.0 for the conventional gun. That gives you the ability to spray everything from a highest build primer surfacer down to doing fine detail and custom work with the mini guns. The mini guns start at $139 and the full size guns are $149. So now you can get a professional grade spray gun for a hobby gun price and you can pick these up anywhere Matco tools are sold. Now here's a real innovation from Flowmaster. It's their new Scavenger Y Collector and it's their internal design that make these so different and so effective. Now most Y collectors are made by simply welding two pipes together, but that makes for a very small point where the pipes actually touch each other. But as you can see, Flowmaster's new collector has pipes formed to make this large D-shaped interface between the two pipes that maximizes the contact area so the exhaust pulses can more effectively pull each other downstream. And it's that less restrictive exhaust flow that makes for better throttle response and more power. In fact, Flowmaster has seen gains of up to 10 horsepower over stock V8 applications. Flowmaster's new line of scavenger Y collectors start around 50 bucks. Thanks for watching, trucks. See you guys next week.